going to discuss the um, rise of an Italian nation, the, the, the coming of fascism uh, into Italy, uh, the rise of Benito Mussolini, and um, we won't get too far today. We'll pick up on our next class um, about Italy becoming an aggressive power much the same way that Japan became a, an aggressive power in Asia. Uh, for Italy, just like we did with Japan, we went all the way back to the 1800s and the Meiji Restoration and whatnot. Uh, for Italy, we got to go back to the 19th century as well. And um, we will note that Italy, much like Germany that we've already briefly mentioned, uh, was not a unified state until the latter half of the 19th century. In 1861, independent principalities and kingdoms and regions within Italy will unite into what is known as the Kingdom of Italy. This is amidst a, a rise in nationalism throughout Europe. Um, what, what creates the Kingdom of Italy is the same thing that we'll be putting together in the next decade, a German state. Um, and it's really the same nationalism that will, by 1914, be leading in part to World War I with, with Serb nationalism and aggression against Austria. So Italy is now a nation. Italy is united. But they're going to have a lot of challenges in, in their first decades. And these challenges will lead ultimately to an unstable government that will make it easier for a man like Benito Mussolini, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about him, make it easier for a man like Benito Mussolini to ultimately seize control of that government and create an Italian, essentially an Italian dictatorship. Yes? So, uh, Kingdom, of Kingdom of Italy. Yep. Um, this Kingdom of Italy um, is more of like a constitutional monarchy um, as kingdoms go. Kind of think of where, the way Britain operates, uh, where there is a legislative body and there's a prime minister, um, but there is a, a royal house as well. Um, there's a lot of division within this new nation of Italy. There is no strong national identity, especially in its earliest decades. Most of the, the wealth and the industrial strength of Italy rested in the northern part of Italy, while the southern portion of Italy uh, was quite a lot poorer and more agriculture-based. If you guys know anything about Italian immigra immigration to the United States that, that ramps up in the late 19th and very early 20th century, the majority of those Italian immigrants were coming from the southern part of Italy um, to the United States. Is that a couple of you guys? Is that any, that, that's, that's you? Okay, excellent. That's you over here? Okay, excellent. So these people up in the north might not have been too fond of your people in the south, all right? These people were seen as like a drag on the state, all right? They, they, were, they were backwards. They weren't as sophisticated as the, the more wealthy northern portions. The period from unification until 1923 in Italy is known as liberal Italy. Liberal Italy. Liberal in the sense of, like, classical liberalism, all right? When I say classical liberalism, we don't want to confuse it with, with American, modern, Hillary Clinton, political left liberalism, all right? Classical liberalism is just the idea that, that there is a democratic state, people can elect representatives, and individual rights are protected by law. By that definition, today's conservatives and today's liberals in the United States are all classical liberals, right? They all support democracy. They all support protection of individual rights. They might have some different beliefs as to which individual rights should be protected or, or, or how much protection certain individual rights should get. But this period in Italy is, is known as liberal Italy, all right? There are open and free, yes ma'am. Yeah, it's like eight, officially 1870 to 1923. So um, in the years after unification to 1923. Now there are free elections, but those free elections aren't universal. There's, uh, and, and no country um, in the late 19th century uh, would have universal suffrage, okay? Women aren't going to be able to vote um, until we get into the 20th century. And for some countries, it's going to be well into the 20th century. And for the most part, even countries that allowed men, male citizens to vote, it's pretty much just property owners um, and, um, and 
So there it's just like wealthier male citizens. And that was the case in Italy. So you're going to find in Italy not only regional divisions, regional divides after the unification, but you're also going to have frustration from the working class and the poor in Italy because they're not politically represented. Uh, the, the wealthy in Italy uh, have the vote, but the poor don't. This will manifest itself at different times in, in the form of general strikes, uh, where, where workers protesting conditions of the state and conditions of their, of their labor will go on strike. A brief time out to mention the whole existence of labor unions, or as they're more often called in Europe, trade unions. Uh, I'm a member of a labor union. I'm sure a handful of your parents, at least, are members of labor unions. Anybody know that your parents are a member of a labor union? Raise your hand. Okay, and that, that's not surprising. I, I think I saw three hands go up. All right, so for this class, that's about 10% of, of the class. Um, if I were to ask that same question, well, if I got my time machine working and I were to go back to my own high school class in, um, in 1995, four, or whatever, and if that class, class were to be asked the same question, a majority of hands would be going up because there were far more workers for uh, the big three uh, back in the 1990s than there are now. There. And beyond that, far more uh, members of labor unions and other industries. Labor union membership in America has been on a steep decline um, over the last couple decades. All right? The late 19th and early 20th century is the rise of labor unions, not only in the United States, but also in, in Western Europe. This is a response to industrialization. This is a response to poor working conditions that follow the industrialization of Europe. And this is an understanding that an individual worker on his own, working in unskilled labor, doesn't have any power at all. Right? When we have mechanized the workforce, the workers themselves become as interchangeable as the parts of the machines that are creating these, these, uh, these goods. And so if you're a frustrated laborer and you go into your boss and you say, boss, I need to only work like six days instead of seven days, or I want to only work 12-hour days instead of 14-hour days, your boss would tell you to hit the high road. And so unions began to be organized in the late 19th century with the idea that collectivizing labor, this is called, unions are collectivized labor, we call it. Workers joining together, workers joining together to organize and collectively tell the boss, hey, we need six days a week instead of seven days a week. Hey, we need 10 hours instead of 14 hours or 12 hours. Hey, we need a, a raise in pay. Hey, need, we need, we need a, a compensation when we're injured on our job. Whatever they might argue for the boss has a much harder time eliminating the entire workforce. You can fire one person easily. You can't fire the entire factory, or you, you would grind down to a halt. All right? It's called collectivized labor. One issue with this in the late 19th century, United States as well, but also Europe, more importantly Europe, is this is deeply connected to notions of socialism. And eventually we'll start throwing the word communism out there. In Karl Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, which you guys might be familiar with, Karl Marx, kind of the, the philosophical brainchild of, uh, of the communist movement, founder of the communist movement, he starts his work talking about the need for workers of the world uniting. Workers of the world uniting. In a book called The Communist Manifesto, Workers of the World Unite. Well, workers are starting to unite in the form of labor unions. So the connection between labor unions and socialist movements, socialist movements that will eventually have the government taking over industries in some, in some states, or ultimately what we see in the Soviet Union, a communist government where the government takes over all means of production of society. They're deeply connected to each other. All right? So as we see the growth of labor unions, it will coincide with the growth of socialist parties throughout Europe and the United States. We have our own. And many of the wealthy, many of the ownership class in Italy, don't care much for these socialist party members or these trade unionists because they're at odds with each other. 
Trade unionists want more for their labor. Business owners want to pay as little as possible for their labor. So we've got that rift in Italy. We also got a separation between church and state that is purposely like codified into the Italian government. But if you guys note that the city of Rome, which surrounds the Vatican City, which is the seat of the Roman Catholic Pope, it's the seat of the Roman Catholic Church, it's in the heart of Italy. And it is in what is now the capital of the Kingdom of Italy. Yet the new Kingdom of Italy didn't want to be beholden to the Roman Catholic Church. So they kept church and state very separate. This is going to be very frustrating to the Roman Catholic Church. And so in addition between, to having a regional rift between north and south and a rift between wealthy and poor or wealthy and working class, there's also a rift between the government and the Roman Catholic Church. We're, all we're doing right now is setting up a lot of factors that show that there's some, there's some rifts, that there's, some, there's some trouble in this new nation of Italy. We will also see the rise of a, a fervent nationalist party in Italy. And in fact, in 1910, an organization called the Italian Nationalist Organization will be born with a goal to create a larger Italian empire and to have Italy be positioned as one of those great powers of Europe. You guys recall when we talked about the origins of World War I, we rattled off five great powers of Europe and they were Britain, France, Russia, Germany and Austria-Hungary. Italy's not in the mix. But the nationalists in Italy want to be in that mix. And how do you become a great power? You create an overseas empire, a greater overseas empire. All right? And so there will be a push for Italy to take its relatively small overseas holdings and grow them. Now, Italy in the late 19th century starts to take part in the carving up of Africa. All right, like all the other European powers are doing. But they have a very small foothold. By the late 19th century, all Italy has in Africa is a little bit of the eastern portion of what's called the Horn of Africa. And that's called, at the time, Italian Somaliland. Today we know it as Somalia. And another little sliver of land off the Red Sea called Eritrea. Today it's known as Eritrea. And that's all they got. That's all they've got. So when you control Italian Somaliland and Eritrea, there's a big area in the middle of that that Italy's not controlling. That in the 19th century and early 20th century is referred to as Abyssinia or Ethiopia. Abyssinia is Ethiopia. Ethiopia is Abyssinia. You can use them interchangeably. Just be consistent. You wouldn't want to use in paragraph one Abyssinia and then turn it into Ethiopia in paragraph two. So today it is the nation of Ethiopia. In the late 19th century, it was one of the only independent areas left of Africa. Along with Liberia in the western portion of Africa. Italy wanted Abyssinia. In the late 19th century, they tried to get it. They went to war to try to conquer Ethiopia. And they lost. Do you guys remember back in 10th grade, you might have looked at a practice DBQ about African actions and reactions to European colonialism. Does this ring any kind of bell? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, I don't know. In that DBQ, you looked at a drawing. It was a drawing of a battle called the Battle of Adawa, A-D-O-W-A. A battle between Italians and Ethiopians. White Europeans versus black Africans, right? In, an, in a now industrialized age battle, or at least on the side of the, the Italians, right? And the Italians lost, <laughs> right? This is, this is a, a white European nation being defeated in battle and being prevented from taking over Ethiopia or Abyssinia. Many nationalists by 1910 want to avenge that defeat, and they want to get that territory. In 1911 and 1912, nationalists pushing the liberal government in Italy will push for a war with Turkey, a war with the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> 
Italy and the Ottoman Empire will fight a very brief war in 1911 and 1912. The hope being, you win this war against a weakening power, the sick man of Europe, Ottoman Empire. You win this war against the Ottoman Empire, you can gobble up some territory from them. And you can become a greater power, which is what Italy wanted to do. They win! And that's how Italy gets a hold of Libya in North Africa. This was Ottoman territory, now it's Italian holdings. And then comes World War I. Notice this, this seems a very similar story to what we talked about in East Asia with Japan, right? Like, attempt to become a great power. You become a great power by gaining overseas territories, right? Yet there's a lot of political issues where the government may not be as in control of the story as, as they would hope. Then we come to the First World War. Now, in the lead-up to the First World War, we've already talked about this, there were two uh, sets of alliances that were organized. Italy had long been a member of what was known as the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Italy had long, since 1882, Italy had been a, been a member of this Triple Alliance. But when war comes, the Triple Alliance is a defensive alliance. If anybody attacks Austria-Hungary, Germany and Italy have to jump in. If Germany is attacked, Italy and Austria-Hungary have to jump in. If Italy is attacked, Austria-Hungary and Germany have to jump in. This is a defensive alliance. But remember, how does the First World War begin? Germany is invading uh, through Belgium to France, and Austria-Hungary bombards Serbia. They start, they start bombing Serbia. So Italy is not compelled by that treaty to join this war. Although there will be a fierce debate by a group that will eventually become known as the interventionists, that want to intervene in the war, that want to get involved in this war. There will be a fierce debate within the Italian government as to what to do. Do we stay neutral? Do we join? If we join, do we join our long allies? Or do we join the Entente powers? A strong push from Italian nationalists encouraged the, the joining of the war on the Entente side. With the hope being, because what are nationalists all about? Winning or taking territory, right? With the hope being, if Italy joins the Entente powers, France and Russia and Britain, and remember too, you don't join the Entente powers unless you think they're going to win in the long run. So Italy, just like Japan, is looking at the tail of the tape here. All right, they've got Germany split in two. They've got the United Kingdom. Maybe one day America will get involved. It looks like the, uh, uh, the Entente powers are going to win. So let's join that side. And if we then defeat Austria-Hungary we can take some territories from Austria-Hungary. Territories that have Italian-speaking peoples in them. This is a theme of the early 20th century. It's a theme of nationalists creating nations that encompass all of the ethnic people of that nationality. This is what Gavrilo Princip wanted to do um, in the creation of a greater Serbia. Have a Serbia for Serb-speaking people, or for Serb people. Italians want an Italy for Italian people. And so you've got to bring in regions of Austria-Hungary, like South Tyrol and Trieste, to bring in these Italian-speaking people that live in the north, but they're a part of Austria-Hungary. And we're soon going to talk about Germany and the German desires to create a greater Germany with German-speaking people. This is a theme that we see uh, repeated. So in April 1915, the war has been going on for, what, like 10 months in April 1915, Italy will join the Entente powers with the signing of what is called the Treaty of London. And out of that Treaty of London, Italy will be promised Italy will be promised some territories. I apologize, I could not find a map as nice as this in English. So Italy will be promised some, some territory, some regions. They're going to get some land from Austria-Hungary. They're going to get some coastal regions from, uh, or along the Adriatic. All right? Italy has made some promises in this Treaty of London.
Despite joining the war, though, deep political divisions in Italy will remain. There are still those that didn't want to join the war on the side of the Entente. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, that's a question I don't know the answer to, but I would imagine because of what I'm going to say next. All right? Uh, and they're the ones that would have more to gain from more territory being acquired and, and more resources available. Um, so there's, there's still some that thought the Italians should have intervened on the side of the Triple Alliance. There are some that thought the Italians shouldn't have intervened at all. And this is largely the socialists in India, in Italy, all right? This, these are largely the socialists in Italy. The socialist party in Italy believed that this was a war that was an imperialist war. It was a capitalist war. And that Italy shouldn't take part in it. One socialist party member whose name we're going to hear throughout the study of the Second World War in Italy, is Benito Mussolini. Benito Mussolini was one of the leaders of the Italian Socialist Party. If you ever see it come up, the Italian Socialist Party is the PSI, probably, I don't know, Party Socialist Italian, oh, I don't know, I don't speak Italian. Uh, so the Italian Socialist Party. Benito Mussolini is one of the lead members of that party. In fact, he's like the publisher of the socialist newspaper. Yes, ma'am, Gianni. Yeah, he, he was just one of the, the higher-ups. But as the war begins, Benito Mussolini doesn't follow the rest of the socialists in that Italy shouldn't be in this war. Once the war begins... He thinks Italy should be in this war, should fight this war, should win this war to create a greater Italy. And so Benito Mussolini will be ousted from the Italian Socialist Party. We'll talk more about Benito Mussolini and the new party he organizes in a few minutes. World War I for Italy was a disaster. They win. They're on the Entente powers. They will win the war, but it is a political and a demographic disaster. 600,000 Italian soldiers will die in the war. In very similar trench warfare that in Italy and between Italy and Austria that we will see on the Western Front. Horribly costly, horribly violent. Many hundreds of thousands more will be injured for Italy. Italy will have 39% of the troops that they mobilize in war fall as casualties. That means either killed in war, died during the war, wounded in war. All right? That is as much as any other country that fought in the First World War. All right? That four out of ten of the guys that put on uniform have something to fall them during the war. So the war is a disaster and it will further divide Italy. And then, because World War I is one of these total wars where the Italian society has to be completely mobilized for war, rationing on the home front, uh, industrial production increasing for the war effort, but wages for workers not following suit, there's going to be an even greater number of industrial workers in Italy who are feeling abused by the industrial system in Italy. So the number of trade unionists will swell. The power of the Socialist Party will swell in Italy. So a lot of political division, and it will only grow because of the First World War. And now we'll go back and talk about Benito Mussolini's new party. This is the flag and the symbol of what becomes known as the fascist party in Italy. Now, this is important to spend a few minutes talking about because today the word fascist is usually used by, by people that want to denigrate anybody that they hate. So you might have people on the political left calling people on the political right fascists. And you can have people on the political right calling the people on the political left fascists. All right? 
a fascist has really lost its meaning. It's kind of like calling someone a jerk now, all right? In its origins, there were fascist ideologies that were starting to grow throughout Europe, not just Italy. Although Italy will have the first strong organized party movement, and they will ultimately be the first nation that becomes a fascist nation when Benito Mussolini will take over. So let's talk in general terms what fascism is, and then we'll talk about how it impacts Italy. Fascism is a strong supporter of nationalism. You can't be a fascist unless you are a fervent nationalist. And when I say nationalist now, we can compare that to, or contrast that to, like, an internationalist. Someone who, after World War I, like, wanted the idea of the League of Nations to try to ease pressures amongst other nations. Who, who thought working with other nations is a better alternative to this fervent nationalism that, in part, led to the First World War. Fascists are fervent nationalists. The nation-state should be seen as a unifying force of the people. And the nation-state needs to be seen as superior to other nations. Foreign influence should be driven out. And in many cases, foreigners will be persecuted in fascist states. Fascism supports the idea of a strong central leader or dictator that will rule a totalitarian one-party state. And if you're in Italy and you've experienced the, the 40 previous years of liberal democracy in Italy with multiple parties and a lot of political squabbling, you might say, yeah, you know what we need? One party to rule them all because we will eliminate all of these political dust-ups that, that prevent the country from, from moving forward in the mind of a fascist. Citizens are subservient to the state. All right? Citizens are subservient to the state. The state is more important than the citizens that make it up. That's very different from the thought that we have in our society, right? Like, we are a nation of, of citizens, of people, um, that, that have created this idea, not necessarily subservient to the notion of the United States. Fascism supports militarism and war. Fascism supports militarism and war, and war. A belief that war can revitalize the state, that war can make the state strong. Now, this is kind of weird that this is developing after World War I because most Europeans after World War I don't want anything to do with another war. Yet fascist ideology says no. Despite the horrors of that war, war can make states great if only you choose to embrace it and fascists will. They also support the idea of the creation of a greater empire, stretching your nation's boundaries beyond its current reach. Fascists are anti-communist. Remember, what, what phrase did I say that Karl Marx uh, began his Communist Manifesto with? Workers of the world unite. The communist ideal is a global communist revolution. All right? Eliminating differences between national boundaries and national identities. Workers of the world, the oppressed workers of the world, should unite together with each other, regardless of where you're from. Rejected by the ultranationalist fascists, all right? So, they're anti-communist, they're anti-internationalist. This symbol here is the symbol of the Italian fascist party. This is called a fascist. It's an old Roman weapon. Rome, like hearkening back to the great days of Rome. It's a, it's a tool. It's a weapon. The idea is you take a bundle of sticks and you bind them together with a blade and it is far stronger than it would ever be, than one individual stick would be. 
It's the idea of if the Italian nation stands together and is bound together by one leader, by one party, it will be stronger than, than any individual entity or any individual region in Italy. So this is the fascies. It becomes the symbol of fascism. It becomes where the word fascist is uh, derived from. All right? That's why we don't see a fascist party in Germany later when we talk about the Nazi party. The Nazis are fascists, but they're not called fascist party because they're not going to use an old Roman symbol uh, for, for their state. That's an Italian thing. Yes? Yeah. Well, no, the blade is, like, that's the sharp part. That's just, like, holding on to the blade. It's kind of like a big axe, right? But it's much stronger. Like, would you rather me whack you with one stick or, like, ten sticks bound tightly together? Well, one stick, I think, would be better to be whacked with. I don't want to be whacked with any sticks. Oh, if you want to whack someone else. Oh, you want to, I was going to whack you, but you can whack someone else. Yeah, you'd much rather have the ten sticks, because that's stronger. I wouldn't want to be hit by ten sticks. Maybe one. Probably not even one. <laughs> All right. After World War I, we're almost done here, guys. After World War I, political challenges in Italy will continue. With the ruling parties, the ruling liberals, losing control of their state. No one party after World War I will gain control of the government. This is a multi-party state. A lot of people quibble about the United States being a two-party system, right? But the one nice thing about a two-party system is we usually elect a leadership. There's usually one party that is in control of the government. One party gets a majority of the votes. But in a multi-party system, if you have three or four or five viable parties splitting votes, nobody's going to be the majority. And so you have to form co what are called coalition governments, where groups from left parties or groups from right parties kind of join together. But ultimately, they're weaker than a majority party would have ever been. After World War I, the treaties that end the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles with Germany, and then there's another one I want you to just hear and make sure you get down in your notes, the Treaty of St. Germain with Austria. That's the one that's going to impact Italy more, the Treaty of St. Germain. Remember, the Paris Peace Conference is what was working on the peace to end World War I. The Treaty of Versailles was the treaty that ended the war with Germany. The Treaty of St. Germain ended the war with Austria. Then there's another treaty called Trianon that ends the war with, uh, with uh, Hungary. Austria-Hungary are going to be split up into two. Italy is deeply frustrated with the Treaty of St. Germain. Because the territories, all of the lands that they were originally promised in that Treaty of London back in 1915 when they joined the war, they got a lot of it, but they didn't get all of it. There were a couple port cities that Italy had hoped to receive, thought they were going to receive, and they didn't get it. And so many in Italy, after suffering from the losses of war, are going to be deeply frustrated that they don't get what they believe was promised to them in the beginning. And the Prime Minister of Italy, a guy named Vittorio Orlando, who was one of those big four of Versailles, along with Wilson and George Clemenceau and David Lloyd George from Britain, Vittorio Orlando, the Prime Minister, is going to resign in shame. Popular anger will grow. We lost 600,000 men and we're not even getting what we originally promised. And with that popular anger and resentment, we will see a growth of that fascist party. Benito Mussolini leading his fascist party. Fostering and supporting and, and growing because of the anger of that war settlement. An economic crisis in the post-war years. Remember, the war is over, right? A lot of those industrial workers during the war, they're not needed anymore. So now unemployment is on the rise and there's greater frustration. Across the Atlantic Ocean in the 1920s, the United States starts to put immigration restrictions on foreigners entering the country, especially from Southern Europe and Asia. We talked about them last week. And so many poor Southern Italians who might have otherwise emigrated out of the country are now stuck in Italy, creating greater pressures on the Italian state. The Bolshevik Revolution 
that communist revolution in the Soviet Union that creates the Soviet Union turns the biggest country of the world into a communist nation. It's got all the other nations of Europe freaked out about communism spreading to their backyard. And who's anti-communist in Italy? The fascists, right. Many conservatives, traditional government conservatives in Italy, begin to support the fascists in hopes that they would prevent the spread of communism. And the fascists and Benito Mussolini would also gain support from the Roman Catholic Church, hoping that if the fascists took control of the Catholic Church, or pardon me, if the fascists took control of Italy, that the Catholic Church would now have more of a say in the operations of the government. They would, they would be in a better position than they were with the earlier government. In, Ma, in uh, October of 1922, Seeing the weakness of the Italian government with all these things pulling it apart. Benito Mussolini will organize tens of thousands of what are called fascist black shirts. Benito Mussolini's black shirts. Why? Because they wore shirts that were black. These were, in many cases, paramilitary thugs. Yes. 22, 1922. 40,000. Fascist black shirts would march to the city of Rome to take over government buildings and government offices and to ultimately topple the Italian government. The king of Italy, a guy named Victor Emmanuel III, the king of Italy, rather than declaring martial law to stop this movement, actually will side with Benito Mussolini. And he offers Benito Mussolini the role of Prime Minister. Now, the king is looking at what's going on. He's got 40,000 angry Italians with clubs and guns and sticks. And they're marching on Rome. If he stands up to them, what might happen to his kingdom? Might, might collapse. So, when in Rome, do as Mussolini. And the, the king sanctions Mussolini and the fascists. And Benito Mussolini will be appointed Prime Minister of Italy. That is it.